Dark Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining Podcasts. Society-13.com I like to listen. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump Podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 164th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. On today's episode, we are featuring another haunted lighthouse, and that is Ledge Lighthouse. It was suggested to us by Brian Morris. And as I got to looking at the history of the lighthouse, there wasn't a whole bunch of material there. So I said, there's got to be something else haunted around it. And sure enough, right across the Long Island Sound, I found the Lighthouse Inn. So we're also going to be featuring that location on this episode. Denise, how is the Ambassador Program going? It's going really well, Diane. So we've had quite a bit of interest and I'm just weeding through and getting everything all set and we'll be soon to announce who the ambassadors of the current locations are. But if you're still interested, you can still send in your interest of your area to be an ambassador. And even if you're listening to this way in the future and you're like, oh, that was so many months ago, still ask because we may not have your area yet. So far, we only have one entry for the exclusive design for our t-shirts that we're going to be using for 2017. Remember, you need to get those in by November 30th. Yes. And also just a reminder, they need to have History Goes Bump, a ghost and a castle, and then anything else you want around it. But those three aspects need to be shown in your design. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Matt with one T. Hey, Matt with one T. Rini. Hey, Rini. William. Hi, William. Taylor. Hi, Taylor. Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Devin. Hey, Devin. Courtney. Hi, Courtney. And Elizabeth. And hello, Elizabeth. Denise, do you have a boat so we can get ourselves over to this ledge lighthouse? I do have a boat, and this is a very interesting lighthouse, so I'm excited to visit. Row, row, row. Your boat gently under stream. History Goes Bump is entirely listener supported. Become an executive producer for as little as $1 a month. Get listed on the website and invited to exclusive virtual meetups. For $5 a month, you get that and exclusive bonus content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. For $10 and above a month, you'll get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump or you can support us via PayPal. Click the support the show tab at historygoesbump.com for more information. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to this moment in oddity. Long before the infamous trials of Nazi war criminals, Nuremberg was a medieval city with courts serving during the Holy Roman Empire. It also was the scene of a reputed UFO battle on April 4, 1561. A woodcut illustration by Hans Glasser documents the battle. He did not witness the event himself. The battle was a mass sighting with residents reporting that they saw cylindrical objects that released many colored discs and globes. People described tubes and crosses in the sky as well. The battle lasted for approximately an hour. Some skeptics claim that the battle was nothing more than an atmospheric phenomenon known as parhelion or sundog. Sundogs are commonly made by the refractions of light from plate-shaped hexagonal ice crystals in high and cold cirrus clouds. This more than likely was an atmospheric disturbance that the people of the 1500s would not understand. But even such a light show would be unique and certainly is odd. I'm 
afraid of the dark. This Day in History On this day, November 16th in 1945, the United Nations Organization for Education, Science, and Culture, also known as UNESCO, was founded. A need was seen after World War II to bring the major countries of the world together to work for the greater good. 37 countries signed the Constitution to found the organization, and it was ratified by 20 of them, including Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Egypt, France, Greece, India, Lebanon, Mexico, New Zealand, Norway, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Today, there are 195 member countries. There are more than 50 offices throughout the world, all focused on the goals of building peace, eradicating poverty, and education. Two of its top priorities are Africa and gender equality. The World Heritage Arm, that has come up several times on this podcast, focuses on sites around the world that feature cultural and natural heritage for regions and humanity in general. These places are all unique and range from the Great Barrier Reef to the Serengeti to cathedrals to the pyramids. This is Victoria from victoriaslift.com. When I'm not taking those who must choose their destiny for a ride on the lift, I'm listening to History Goes Bump podcast. History isn't boring, it's terrifying. The past remains with us, and so do its spirits. Can you hear them calling? They want you to know their stories. Listen now to their voices and the truth from the past. The New England area is dotted with lighthouses to protect ships from the treacherous shores of the coast. Some of these lighthouses are more inland, like the Ledge Lighthouse that sits in the Long Island Sound. It has a unique design that makes it appear to be a house floating out on the water, although the bright flashing light atop is a dead giveaway of its true purpose. Across the water is the abandoned lighthouse inn that started out as a summer mansion and later served as an inn. Both of these locations are not only historic properties, but they are reputed to be haunted. Join us as we explore the histories and hauntings of the Ledge Lighthouse and the Lighthouse Inn. New London, Connecticut sits along the Long Island Sound. The area was first settled by the Mohegan tribe. Early in the 1600s, this tribe was originally the Pequot. A rivalry developed between the chief, who was Sassacus, and another member named Uncas. The dispute was so great that Uncas left, taking a group with him. He was named chief and they called themselves the Wolf People. Mohegan means Wolf People. The main reason for the dispute arose from dealing with European settlers. Uncas was one of those guys, he wanted to work with the English, and Sassacus was not interested in working with the English, as most of the Pequot were not interested in working with them, so there was this war that came up. Uncas was successful with the help of the Europeans, and so the Europeans said that they would protect the Mohegans during King Philip's War. Settlers would come and buy land from the Mohegan, but eventually when Connecticut became a colony, they decided to rule upon this whole land sell thing, and they decided that they were no longer going to compensate the Mohegan for the land that they were being sold. Can you imagine? We're going to go to our courts and decide that we're not going to pay you for the land that you're selling us. I don't know how that works, but eventually the tribe was penniless and they decided to relocate to upstate New York with the Oneida tribe. The Pequot called this area Namiag, and I do apologize, we could not find a pronunciation, so if anybody has it, we would be glad to know that. The original settlement that would later become New London was founded by John Winthrop Jr. in 1646. When it came to naming the settlement, the people wanted to name it London after London, England, but the Connecticut General Assembly wanted to name the town Fair Harbor. The colonists said they would rather continue with Namiag if they couldn't have London. The legislature caved, and the town was officially named New London on March 10th of 1658. New London was the first official port of the Connecticut colony. It was the perfect spot as the Thames River was wide and deep and perfect for ships to maneuver through. The port was a maritime center with shipbuilding and trade that specifically centered on the West Indies. The city would be incorporated in 1784 and was one of the first five cities in Connecticut. The 19th century brought huge growth and prosperity to the city, with Sealing and Whaling building it into the second largest New England port, and by 1850, the railroad had arrived. 
The prime water location would eventually bring the Coast Guard Academy here. One of the most unique in-appearance lighthouses in the world is Ledge Lighthouse, and it's found off of New London in Fisher's Island Sound. When I first saw the picture of this lighthouse, Denise, I went, wait, how can that be a lighthouse? Because we are so ingrained in our minds to think of this cylindrical Paul Tower column rising up. So when you see this thing that basically looks like a three-story house sitting out on a rock, it's like... How can that be a lighthouse? Yeah, so it's very, very unique. I would definitely love to get that stamp in my book. So one of these days, we're heading to Connecticut. And the really fun thing about this one is that I have one of my clients has pictures of lighthouses in her bedroom. And I've seen the picture of this in there. And I guess it just never registered to me that that's a lighthouse. It looks like a house and to wonder about it. So here I am talking about it. So I just thought that was really neat. This lighthouse stands at the mouth of the Thames River. The New London Harbor Light had been built upriver, but increased traffic made it obvious that they needed to bring another lighthouse in here, so they decided to do that in 1900, and that's when they built the Ledge Lighthouse. It took until 1906 for the United States Senate to authorize construction. Six years to authorize construction. Are we surprised? Um, Not so much. (laughs) And another two years for T.A. Scott Company to be contracted to build it. The lighthouse was completed in 1909 and originally named Southwest Ledge. But after it was pointed out that another lighthouse had the same name, the southwest part was dropped. Two wealthy homeowners suggested that the lighthouse be designed in the same style as the homes in the area. The structure incorporates a mixture of the colonial revival and French Second Empire styles and is made from granite and brick. Ledge is three stories and has 11 rooms. And it really does look like a house sitting alone on an island with the light blazing from a tower atop it. When it was first lit on November 7, 1909, it was equipped with a fourth-order Fresnel lens that had been crafted in France. The original lens was later replaced, but it can still be seen on display at the Custom House in New London. This particular beacon had three white flashes followed by a red flash every 30 seconds. Ledge Lighthouse had a standard crew of three men, but sometimes a fourth man was added. They spent their days polishing the brass and the lens, painting surfaces to keep them new and clean, oiling fixtures, and keeping the light fueled. The lighthouse has been restored throughout the years and is ongoing. Three windows were replaced just last month in October of 2016. Tours are offered in the summer season, so right now they've closed down their season, so you can't go out there right now, but during the summer you can go visit. The Project Oceanology Boat takes visitors on a 10-minute ride to Ledge Light from Avery Point in Groton, or Groton. I'm not sure exactly how you say that. As shocking as it is, I'm assuming that on that 10-minute ride, there must not be much they tell them, because that is literally all I could find. That that just, to me, seems incredible, especially since it is such a unique... I mean, I love lighthouses, and I'm always looking to go visit them, and this one is so unique to anything I've ever seen before. Yeah, I was looking on their Facebook page for anything, which is where I got that they just replaced some windows, you know, because that's not really a big deal. But I was like, well, at least it's something. Uh, So if anybody has been out to Ledge Lighthouse that is listening to this episode, we'd love to hear from you via email. We always share any updates on stuff. So it doesn't matter if it's down the road. Let us know. Absolutely. And if anybody hasn't been out there but lives in the Connecticut area, When it reopens, if you'd want to do a little field trip for us, we'd really appreciate that as well. But one thing a lot of people seem to know about this lighthouse and that the website for this lighthouse really focused on was haunting, which I was kind of surprised about. Yes, so the ledge does have a resident ghost that's fairly well known. His name is Ernie, and it's believed that he had been one of the keepers. Information is hard to find about him, but there is a legend that has grown up around him. It is said that he served during the 1920s or 30s and that he had married a much younger woman and she did not follow him to the lighthouse. While he was away, she fell in love with the captain of the Block Island Ferry. She decided to run away with him and Ernie was heartbroken and in his distraught state of mind, he climbed to the roof of the lighthouse and flung his body over the edge. The body was never recovered. It is rumored that he has haunted the lighthouse ever since. Cold spots are felt and disembodied voices are heard. Strange noises seem to have no cause behind them. Boats that are tied up become untied, seemingly on their own. The lighthouse embraces the legend and has a furnished keeper's room with a mannequin of Ernie. Across the sound from Ledge Lighthouse to the northwest and through some trees stands the Lighthouse Inn. The inn was built in 1902 and was originally the mansion of one man, Steel Baron Charles Strong Guthrie of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
It specifically was meant to be a summer home. The 12-acre field it was built in attracted Guthrie because of the wildflowers growing everywhere. He called his home Meadow Court for this reason. The house was designed by Boston architect William Ralph Emerson, and the landscape architect was Frederick Law Olmsted. Emerson is considered by historians to be one of the inventors of the shingle-style house. Meadow Court was designed in the mission style with Mediterranean overtones. It was built in a half circle so that all the bedrooms had views of the beautiful gardens. Guthrie picked the location because the Pequot House was nearby and served as the cornerstone for the summer resort colony, and the area was described as a small version of Newport, Rhode Island. In 1927, the mansion became an inn, and because of the nearby lighthouses, it was christened Lighthouse Inn. Most of the land was sold off, and the inn only retained 2.8 acres of the original 12 acres. There were 27 suites to rent. In the 1930s, Hollywood celebrities like Joan Crawford and Betty Davis stayed here. In 1979, the inn suffered a severe fire on the upper floors and required a $2.5 million renovation. Over time, the inn had become a popular gathering place for dinner parties and weddings, and their Sunday brunch was famous. The inn closed in 2008 after years of being dogged with financial issues. And those financial issues were immense. When I started looking into this and trying to find the history on it, what started popping up a lot was auction here, auction there, another auction here. And it seems like the city had taken ownership of this location and was trying to dump it and get rid of it, do something with it because the bank kept repossessing it. And one of the other problems that they've had with this is that it's not right on the beach. So what they've had to do is lease out beach access. And they were so delinquent in it. I think they were like $200,000 delinquent or maybe it was 20,000, something like that. But they were so delinquent that they had lost their access to the beach. So in trying to sell the property to anybody, it's like, okay, well, you have to pay this much in our back taxes and you have to pay this much for the beach access that we're back. And so it's really hard to sell something that's already got all these liens on it. And then it's something that has fallen into disrepair because it just hasn't been loved on. But a lot of the comments I saw on it is that there was this restaurant that was there. They had this famous Sunday brunch and a lot of people really enjoyed the restaurant. So I don't know if it was just poor management that they just were not able to upkeep it. And it's just continued to have problems. It's the only location in Connecticut that's been designated as a historic hotel of America. So you think that the city would at least maybe try to do something with it to open it up for the people? I don't know. Yeah, you would hope so. So the first auction that I was able to find on it was in 2010. So I think it went into foreclosure in 2008, and they auctioned it off in 2010. And it was awarded to New Haven businessman Anthony Acree for a bid of $1.25 million. Remember that number. Acree promised to restore the location, and his family was going to rent it as a restaurant and inn. I'd seen this, but before I'd seen that, I'd seen that they just had an auction last month. So I'm like, well, how did it get auctioned in 2010 and then auctioned again in 2016? That doesn't make any sense, especially if somebody's going to renovate it and, you know, open it up as this inn again. Well, apparently they had a bunch of break-ins that followed this auction. So I don't know if the inn was getting broken in before, if it just happened after it got auctioned. I don't know, but Acree decided to withdraw his bid. In 2014, he participated in another auction that they had, and he offered another bid. This one was for $100,000. So the first bid was $1.25 million. Now it's down to $100,000. And the city said, yeah, I think we're going to look at that. So Jeez. they started to look at it until everybody started saying, have you looked at this Acree guy and seen what his background is? So the city ended up rejecting allowing him to take ownership because he was very unscrupulous in some of his business practices. And it wasn't even so much that the city was rejecting him as that he lost his license or whatever in order to be able to do what he was doing. And uh, what happened is basically he and several associates, and now this, I don't know if everything went to court and what ended up being ruled, but what they were saying was unscrupulous is that he and several associates were accused of enriching themselves at the expense of the Alaska Native Corporation that provides funding for the Eskimo people of Kotzebu in northwest Alaska. So I can see why they didn't want this guy to take over this inn. The inn sold again, as I said, back here uh, last month. So the high bidder was Alwyn Christie, and he's from Glastonbury. His bid was 260000 When he was asked about his plans, he said that he wants to reopen it as an inn again. 
So we hope that eventually you'll be able to stay at this historic inn once again, and we hope they retain its charm. We do wonder if they know about the rumors of hauntings at this location, though. Do they have to disclose that or maybe not for an inn? That's an excellent question, Denise. I have never thought about that because I know if you have a house, there's quite a few states where you do have to disclose if you've had any kind of haunting activity. I'm not sure about an inn or a hotel if you'd have to if it's a business. That's interesting. If any of you know, let us know. The Lighthouse Inn has several ghosts. A hurricane blew through in 1938 and two children were killed at the inn. It is believed that they're still at the inn in the afterlife, haunting the bedrooms and hallways. There's also a story about a young girl that may or may not be separate from the story of these children. Not much is known about a backstory, but she appears to be an intelligent haunting. She is heard running in the corridors, and the doors open and close on their own when this happens. She is heard talking and laughing. A female ghost wearing a Victorian-era dress has been seen and heard walking in the halls, particularly at night. She seems to be more of a residual than intelligent haunting. There's another woman here, and she is our lady in white. Gotta have one. (laughs) She's reputed to be in white because she is a bride, so she's literally wearing a wedding dress. The tragic story that is told about her took place on her wedding day. She was coming down a winding center staircase at the inn when she tripped and tumbled down the stairs. She broke her neck in the fall and her deceased body came to rest at the feet of her groom. I can't even imagine how horrific that would be. Oh, geez. And you're sure there's probably a lot of guests standing there watching her come down the stairs. Oh, how horrible. This happened in 1930 and she has haunted the place ever since. And I didn't find any newspaper reports. So again, this could just be urban legend. The scent of her perfume is detected at times. Her full-bodied apparition is seen hanging out in dark corners, and her reflection, which to me would be the creepiest thing, is seen in windows, which means if you're looking out the window to look outside, all of a sudden you see somebody is standing behind you, kind of like seeing a reflection in a mirror. I think it would be kind of the same as in a window. I would jump about 20 feet if that (laughs) happened to me. The New York Times even featured her in a 2007 article. Ghost hunters investigated the inn in 2004, and Steve felt something unseen touch him in the basement tunnels. The pressure felt as heavy as 15 pounds, he said. There was a recorded drop in temperatures of 30 degrees that could not be explained. And these basement tunnels, I couldn't find any information on them, so I'm not sure why there would be basement tunnels down there. I don't know if it was, since they turned this into an inn, if it was some kind of food storage. I'm not really sure. The Ledge Lighthouse continues to keep watch of maritime traffic. Is the spirit of Ernie still carrying on his job as keeper in the afterlife? Is the Lighthouse Inn harboring the spirits of former guests, or are these stories of ghosts just made up? Are the Ledge Lighthouse and the Lighthouse Inn haunted? That is for you to decide. Definitely a lighthouse I want to visit, and very cool that you can actually take a boat out to it and get in it and and look around. Exactly, and by the time we get up there, maybe they'll have the inn redone and ready to stay in. Hopefully it's dog-friendly. Which means you are thinking that it would be okay to stay there. Well, no, at a campground nearby. <laughs> just I thought other well, you people. Just said if, oh, you hope dogs. Oh, if other people want to stay, you exactly, hope dogs. Exactly, you know, because people like to do meetups. I just want to make sure they can bring their dogs. We'll be staying in our camper. Thanks. Great, Denise. Fabulous. No Tim bunking today. Want to make sure you guys check out our website, historygoesbump.com. Denise, if people want to send us feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we did get an email from Scott, and he let us know that he really enjoys the podcast, looks forward to the new episodes, but he misses our old sign-off. It was really creepy, and he's listened to it over and over in the past to listen to what that scary woman was saying about society. That voice is something I would expect to hear in the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland. She was absolutely terrifying, and I miss her so much. Well, what happened with that, you guys probably all noticed that a few months ago, we switched the bumper. We put it at the beginning now, and it's totally different. And you guys may recognize Dan Foytick's voice in there. Well, Society 13 Podcast Network is a network that we joined. It's just a group of us podcasters that are there to support each other and advertise each other's shows and and that kind of thing. It's not like we're like any of those big networks that you see over on iTunes like Gimlet, Podcast One. We're not like that. But it's just we decided to have something that we could all have together. And we've been bringing on so many different podcasts to it that eventually the bumper wasn't really accurate with all of the shows that were a part of it. And some of them have gone away or changed or things like that. So we ended up having to change that bumper. And that's the new one at the beginning. So I'm sorry you miss it, Scott. 
I guess you could listen to some old episodes to get it back. Or just tape, tape that voice and just have it play <laughs> over and over and over right before you go to bed. Since Scott did ask about that, I told him a little secret about it. And it has something to do with that voiceover artist. But I'm not going to tell you guys because I'm just that way. <laughs> oh, Diane, you're terrible. <laughs> Maybe if you email me about it, I'll let you in on the secret too. I think I have let people in the Spooktacular crew know about it. I'm not for sure. I want to thank Aaron for sending us your topic idea. And Jojo sent us an email as well, said she loves listening to the podcast and following us on Instagram. And we try to get as much stuff up on Instagram as we can whenever we remember. We're old fuddy-duddy, so <laughs> it's a little hard for us to keep up on some of that social media of, of you uh, youngsters. So am I fuddy or duddy? Well, I like fudge, so I'll go with fuddy because that kind of is kind of like duddy because I'm like, duh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And then she said, first, don't let the bad reviews get you down. People have no idea what it takes to create and produce each and every episode. I appreciate all your efforts. Well, we greatly appreciate that, Jojo. Have a couple of iTunes reviews to share with everybody. First one is from Freddie Toby. Fun and informative. Five stars. I had never listened to a podcast until about two months ago when my commute time doubled. I admit some trepidation because I don't like radio show hosts very much, but the content of History Goes Bump sounded up my alley. I'm very glad I gave it a chance because not only are the subjects fun and interesting, but Denise and Diane are more like your favorite aunts than obnoxious radio personalities. Well, welcome to our nephew and nicehood. <laughs> exactly. Gal, how many do we have now? <laughs> a lot. All I have to say is Christmas is going to be expensive. L. Hutchings, loving it, five stars. Heard about this podcast from the Most Notorious Podcast, and I think it's great listening to all of the old episodes while also staying up to date on the new ones. If you love history and strange phenomena, this is for you and the hosts are absolutely charming. Well, thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm so glad you found us from the Most Notorious Podcast. I had a great time joining Eric on there for his Halloween episode. Yes, and thank you for listening. And then Johnny let us know that he'd heard about our show on Jim Harold's Campfire. So thanks so much, Jim, again, for mentioning our podcast. We greatly appreciate that. Yes, and we want some s'mores from your campfire. You know, Jim used to have a little crackling fire sound effect in the back, but I think he stopped doing that, and I kind of miss it. All I know is it's getting colder in Florida, so pretty soon we can start doing fires out on our lanai again. Well, and you know in December we will be doing a fire out there because we got to have a fire for our ghost stories. Absolutely. Looking forward to sharing those with you. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producer, Kelly Taylor. Thanks. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com.